congregation, we are continuing. We're, we're doing part three of our series on uh, stress, anxiety, and distress. A and today we're looking at Psalm 27. And there are a couple things that we really need to focus on here. W one is that, that on the one hand, we do not need to be ashamed or feel condemned about being anxious or stressed or, or distressed. It, there, is, there is dysfunction and, and, as it were, sin at work. However, just like with all the sins and temptations that we face, the gospel says that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so we don't need to walk around beating ourselves up about feeling worry, just like we don't need to walk around beating ourselves up about forgetting our breath prayers. Uh, we, we just need to learn to get beyond those worries, to give those worries to God, to get whatever help we need for them so that we can grow, as the scriptures say, into the fullness of Christ who is our head, right? We, we need to grow up, and we don't need to wallow in our struggles, but rather we need to learn to grow so that we no longer have to struggle with that. Now, I mean, the reality is, is that often, you know, we all know this, you, you, you face a struggle, you seem to have conquered the struggle, and then a few days or minutes or weeks or months or years, that very same struggle comes back and we have to fight it all over again. Or, uh, you know, we, we face down and we conquer through God's help a struggle, and then, uh, you know, a few hours or minutes or days or weeks or months or years down the road, we face a very similar struggle at a slightly different level, right? And then we, we learn and we grow that much more, right? A and that's okay. In this life, we are not going to achieve perfection. The scripture is pretty clear about that. But there is hope for both the progress that God will make in us through his Holy Spirit working within us and for the life to come wherein we will be perfected and glorified. And so we continue our battle, we continue our fight against sin and temptation, including the temptation to worry, which is awfully overpowering. So <clears throat> on the one hand, we want to be aware that we don't need to wallow in uh, beating ourselves up over worry and stress and anxiety. On the other hand, we need to remember that ideally because of God, because of Christ in us, there really is nothing at all to fear. Nothing at all. A and this goes to some pretty extremes, or pretty extreme extremes, some pretty significant lengths. So let's look at Psalm 27 and see what David has to say uh, to us this morning. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. 
At his sacred tent I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make noise to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. (coughs) Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother, (coughs) excuse me, forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes. (coughs) For false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. (coughs) The word of the Lord. (coughs) Well, brothers and sisters, if I can (coughs) survive... <coughs> took something that was supposed to help and it helped for a few minutes <coughs> excuse me and now it's gone anyway so this is there are some important extremes here as I mentioned and we need to be aware of them Because this is where we ought to be, (coughs) excuse me, this is where we ought to be heading as we grow in our faith. Now notice that David himself (coughs) is not quite there, right? He pleads out with God, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek. And then he goes on and later on in the the psalm, (coughs) He says in verse 9, do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. So David is not himself totally there. He is not free of fear completely. In fact, David has these worries that gnaw at him. However, he knows whom he should trust in. He knows deeply and totally and intimately who he should trust in, and he knows this because of his own experiences. And so this psalm that he writes is a psalm that resonated so deeply with the people of Israel that, of course, they included it in the psalms themselves, but also as far as archaeologists and and scholars, biblical scholars can tell, they also use this psalm as sort of a preparation for battle, a hymn before their battle. (coughs) And it makes sense because David is speaking here not just of spiritual enemies, but actual, factual, physical human enemies as well. The evil people who would besiege him and his place. And of course, we know that when we face battles, whether they be spiritual or whether they be physical or some combination thereof, because let's face it, really they're often almost invariably a physical and a spiritual battle. When we face those things, it is natural, especially for us in our fallen state, to feel fear, to worry, to be anxious, to be stressed out, to be distressed about all of these things. But notice the extremes that David says that he will not be worried about. He is not going to be worried about war breaking out against him. In verse 3, he will not be afraid of an army besieging him. In verse 3 as well, He's not going to be afraid of the wicked advancing against him in verse 2. 
In fact, in verse 1, he starts off and he says rhetorically, uh, he says, Who, of whom should I be afraid? And the answer, the implied answer is no one. There is no one that he should be afraid of. And by implication, there is nothing that he should be afraid of either. <clears throat> now this is really important for us. Not very many of us face physical battles against actual human armies. Um, I myself never served in the armed forces, and <clears throat> I don't know if it, have any of you served in the armed forces at all? Okay, so none of us here have, right? So none of us have experienced that particular stress or distress, the, the reality of facing a human enemy army. However, we have faced others. <clears throat> For example, the fear of failure. Chris shared that just last week or the week before. The fear of financial ruin, right? Right? If we run our own business or if we are afraid of losing our job <coughs> or afraid of whatever struggles financially that the world might have for us, we can be afraid of that. We can be afraid of that as a church as well. We can't afford to support this, that, or the other ministry because we have not enough money for that. We can't afford to pay this salary or that salary, not that anybody's ever said that or anything like that in this congregation that I'm aware of, but... <coughs> We can be stymied, we can be stressed out and, and fall to the temptation to worry so much that we choose not to do what God, we feel God is calling us to do. <coughs> I'll use my father-in-law as an example. Sorry, Dad, I'm not going to use you as an example today. <laughs> my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, actually, so way back in the day, uh, my father-in-law, he became, uh, he and his wife, they became Christians. And, and not too, too long after that, uh, dad felt called to begin Christian schools. Um, <clears throat> and you may remember this story, but he, he was converted uh, and saved in a Baptist church. Um, he He's been in the Baptist church ever since then, and he knew that, you know, Christian Reformed people were likely the most, uh, most probable supporters of Christian day school education back in his day. And so <clears throat> he got his education that he needed, and then he would go to various communities partnering with often the Christian Reformed folk there in starting off a Christian school. In, in fact, uh, Amy and Gwyneth uh, both were benefit, bene, beneficiaries of that um, as they both attended one of the schools that Trevor, uh, together with others, started. Cornwall Christian School, which sadly no longer exists, was one of those schools. Northumberland Christian School in Coburg was one of those schools. Um, he also helped sort of reboot or restart Wallaceburg Christian School as they had had some significant struggles. And he also helped to do uh, something similar with Allison Christian School. Any others that I'm missing? <coughs> okay. Anyways, right? So he did that. A and Gwyneth shares the story of her being a little, little kid, like seven or something like that, seven, ten, <coughs> and being in the car with her mother. And what's that? Nine. Okay. And uh, her hearing on the radio, um, you know, some news stuff or whatever, and then hearing her mother laugh. And she said, you know, what's, what's funny kind of thing. And her mother said, wow, they just announced uh, the, the poverty line for this year, the low income cutoff for this year. And uh, <coughs> your family, we, we are living below the poverty line. And yet they had a home to live in, they had a car to drive around, they had food, all the food that they needed. They were able, Trevor would never um, accept free tuition, uh, even though he was at a 
starting off a Christian school. He would pay for his kids for their tuition. And <clears throat> they were having all that they needed provided. The butcher would drive up and unload half a cow into their freezer or whatever, and the, the orchard people would give them apples, and the farmers would give them stuff, and, and, and so they survived. But not only did they survive, they thrived. They consistently committed to giving 10% of their income before expenses, before taxes to the church. There's another time where, where an accountant in their church, a different story, an accountant in their church said, hey, you know, Trevor and Sharon, why don't I come over and, and <clears throat> you know, look over your, your finances, look over your, uh, your ins and outs, and we'll see if we can make things a little bit easier for you. And, and by the end of the evening, he was weeping at their table and said, this doesn't make any sense. How is this possible? You're... Your ins don't equal your outs <laughs> in a bad way. <laughs> How are you surviving? And Gwyneth's mom said, oh, should they be equal? <laughs> should it be the other way? <clears throat> now, don't get me wrong. Trevor and Sharon would be the first to say that they are, they are not anywhere near perfect. And they would probably be uncomfortable to some degree with me sharing some of these stories, except insofar as the glory goes to God. Okay? So this is not about yay Trevor and Sharon. It's about yay God. Because God gave them a faith. God gave them a faith that didn't care about whether their response or whether their financial house was reasonable. They knew what they had been called to do, and so who cares whether the finances make sense? But that is precisely the opposite of how we often think, right? How will I make a living doing this? How will I survive doing this? Won't I be a laughing stock? If I do something this ludicrous and I fall on my face, won't it be terrible if I have to declare bankruptcy? How embarrassing. How shameful. How terrible. <clears throat> but God doesn't think that way. And David knows that full well. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. <clears throat> you know what a siege is, right, of course. A siege is, is what happens when an army or multiple armies comes to a town, uh, usually a walled town or city, and they lay siege to that. They, they camp their armies around, and maybe they uh, build siege uh, machines to try and knock down the walls, or, or maybe they just sit it out and try and wait it out so that the people inside have to starve to death or, or die of lack of water, dehydration, whatever. In fact, in Israel's history, there were some terrible sieges that, that culminated in, in and I'm sorry to say this, but it culminated, this is the biblical record, in people eating each other, in people eating babies. This is how terrible a siege can be. A siege happens when things are not going well for you militarily. If things are going great for you, then no one is going to be able to besiege you. And yet here is David saying that even if an army besieges me, my heart will not fear. 
Why? Verse 5. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. So David says there's nothing to fear. There's no financial destruction to fear. Not that you're going to be rolling in dough all the time. There's no no shame to fear. There's There's no besieging or embattlement to fear. There's no torture to fear. There is no enemy to fear. There is no one and nothing to fear. Now, this is where it gets even stranger. It's not that there's nothing to fear because nothing will go wrong or badly. Right? That is not promised. We do not believe in sort of a prosperity gospel that says, if you are just faithful enough, then everything material, physical, emotional will go well in your life. You will never struggle with depression. You will never struggle with finances. You will never experience bankruptcy. You will never be mocked or, or laughed at by others. You will never be tortured or abused. You will never have... No, no. That's not the kind of gospel we believe in. Somehow, we believe in a gospel where Paul can say that he faces suffering all day long And that's not a bad thing. That's okay. Because he's doing it for the glory of God. And so it's possible that you may hear God's call to do something crazy and you may end up having to declare bankruptcy. Or you may end up living on the street. Or you may end up dying of tuberculosis. I don't know. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is true for local churches, by the way, too. Not that this is the reality that we are facing anytime soon, but if a local church decides to follow the call of God in the mission of God, And they do that to the best of their ability. And the doors of that church still close. And that church ceases ceases to exist as a local congregation. So what? If they were faithful to the call of God, who cares? So too with you and I. If Trevor and Sharon had ended up having to live on the street, if, like happened, one or more of those schools that they started up eventually ended up closing, if Gwyneth or her brother grew up with some trauma (laughs) related to that, Well, okay. They were being faithful. They did the best they could to honor God, to follow Him. So there is nothing to fear. But now we go back to the reality that the the truth is, is that we do fear. David fears. We all fear. We all have that stress. We all have that anxiety. And so what do we do with it? We talked about doing our breath prayers, and that's great. That's wonderful. However, we also need to dive into Scripture, especially Scriptures like this, to remind ourselves that though we may fear in one moment, we need to give that over to God and remember that we really ultimately have nothing to fear. But the reality is is that some of us struggle with fear, anxiety, depression, stress, distress, whatever, we struggle with it, you know, perhaps in slightly different ways than others. Some of us have chronic anxiety. Should Should we be wandering around beating up ourselves because... (coughs) 
I clearly don't have enough faith because I keep on struggling with panic attacks. No. No. That's why there's help. There's help. We believe in a God who brings healing. Now that God brings healing in a variety of different ways, for sure. Sometimes God reaches down and provides a miracle and provides healing in that way. People have been prayed over and received healing for their emotional, physical, psychological disorders and struggles. Absolutely. Sometimes God heals us through the community of believers, a mentor, a friend, a, a brother or sister in Christ who comes alongside us and helps us to walk through the fear. Sometimes God heals us through the work of professionals like doctors and nurses and healthcare workers, psychologists, counselors, psychiatrists. There is no shame whatsoever in getting help for your emotional, physical health. Right? I, I heard from... Uh, one of our farmers earlier this week, that they had <coughs> an equipment failure and they went and were able to borrow uh, some tools to help with that, right? Is there shame in that? Is that a shameful thing to do, to go and get help from somebody else with your machines? No. Why would it be a shame to go and get help for your mind? for your heart, right? So there's, there's help for us in, you know, professionals. There is help for us in miraculous healing. There is help for us in the community of believers. There is help for us in the, the healing processes of our own minds, our own hearts. See, God created the mind and the heart to be incredibly resilient. And so as time goes by, often things are dealt with without us really even doing anything at all about it. And so these are the, the two things, the three things that we can draw from this passage for us today. One is that there is no one and nothing. There are no one, there is no one and nothing. There are, is, are, I don't know. Nothing and no one to fear. Two, is that that goes to all the extremes. Bankruptcy, shame, torture, death, um, you know, anything. Whatever it is, not to be feared. If we are doing the will of God, then who cares? And three, we don't need to feel shame we can get help and healing for our fear. In fact, it is part of God's plan. It's part of maturing and growing up. Right? Brothers and sisters, we are a, uh, a tap church. Okay? Remember this? A, a, a while ago, we, we made a, a, a contract with an organization called Shalem Mental Health Network, and they have a program called CAP, the Congregational Assistance Plan. And this is absolutely fantastic. And it, we wanted to, A, make it possible to talk about mental, emotional um, health. Uh, we wanted to make it more normal to talk about that. B, we wanted to provide resources for the congregation to get the help that maybe they needed. <clears throat> and so we, we are doing this. What a congregational assistance plan is, just to remind you, is that uh, Shalem has a whole bunch of qualified counselors, psychologists, uh, psychiatrists, therapists, uh, whatever I'm missing, right? They have lots of people available to do counseling 
with you. Whether that's for you as an individual, whether you're struggling with worry or anxiety, whether you're struggling with depression, whether you're struggling with relational conflict, whether you're struggling with issues in your job or issues coming out of your job because you had to quit your job or got fired or whatever it may be. If you just want a mental health checkup, they are there. And the church has contracted to provide up to six sessions a year for you with no cost beyond what we share as a congregation. It's like, it's like mental health insurance almost, right? That may, that may sound like not a lot, once or six in a year, but that's once every other month. And if you need to have some time with you as an individual for counseling, that's fine. If you need some time as a couple for counseling, that's fine. If you need time for your kids to have counseling, that's fine too. They all get their individual allotment of six, right? And there's, that's awesome. That's good. So brothers and sisters, let's grow out of worry, out of anxiety. It won't happen overnight, probably. It might. You might get that miracle that suddenly, like Paul on the road to Damascus, things change like crazy in an instant. But for most of us, it probably won't happen overnight. We need to mature. And we can do that together. If, you're, if you feel that God is calling you to do something big or small and you're afraid, don't worry. Let's talk about it. Let's pray about it. Let's journey together on it. And don't let things like money or shame or fear keep you away from it. Brothers and sisters, David, David was learning not to fear, though an enemy would besiege him. Instead, he remained confident that he would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And he advised us to wait for the Lord, be strong, and take heart, and wait for the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we confess that all of us, on some level, are worry warts. We confess, O oh God, that things big and small stand in our way from doing your will. Sometimes it's just embarrassment. And sometimes, O oh God, it is fear of some pretty reasonable consequences and everything in between. Lord, forgive us for our fear. Forgive us for our doubt. Help us, O oh God. Help us to learn to live confident in your goodness. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.